Welcome to Secret Sound. I'm your host, Matt Marble. Join me as we explore the hidden history of American music. With each episode, I'll be highlighting fascinating yet marginalized composers from the fringes of American memory, as well as new perspectives on a few well-known artists. We'll also be exploring some of the esoteric traditions that influence these artists, like theosophy, astrology, Enochian magic, and more. This first episode, The Illusioned Ear, focuses on 19th century mystic philosopher and psychic pianist Francis Grierson. Through Grierson, we dive deep into spiritualism, seances, and the illusions of sound. Ghosts are everywhere. Hans Vermillion, start of five. Bright cotillion, ravens die. Nightshades promise, spirits strive. To the living, let now the dead come alive. Come alive. Come alive. Hi, and welcome to Secret Sound. That was a scene from the movie... Beetlejuice? And it's close to how the average person might actually imagine a seance, or the summoning of spirits to communicate with the living. Now it is the stuff of horror movies and occultism, but it was once widely popular in America, notably intriguing both President Abraham Lincoln and his wife Mary Todd. And whether you believe in spirit communication or not, seances are fundamentally theatrical. They directly work with the emotions, expectations, and perceptions of the guests, many of whom come there wanting to believe. And sound is a common feature or tool of the psychic medium. In fact, the spiritualist craze began with the rapping sounds of a ghost named Mr. Splitfoot. The Fox sisters, Leah, Margaret, and Kate Fox, claimed to hear these sounds in their childhood home in Hydesville, New York and they managed to demonstrate the phenomena to the public in 1849. Their demonstrations incited mass American interest in spiritualism, spurred on by all the emotional tragedy of the Civil War. Almost 40 years later, interestingly, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, the sisters announced the hoax of their Mr. Splitfoot. They had faked the ghostly sounds by cracking their toe knuckles. This upset the public and put a dent in the popularity of seances, but only marginally. Meanwhile, subsequent seance leaders went out of their way to stage auditory illusions, plucking musical instruments from under the table or placing musicians in hidden rooms. These auditory illusions were parodied during a seance scene in filmmaker Ed Wood's 1959 film, Night of the Ghouls. Through my powers of the supernatural, I, and I alone, can bring him to this room tonight. From that place in the deep blackness of death, from which no visitor is to return. Where the sun is seen to rise, and the sun is seen to set. Where the gracious moon comes from the east, in its long journey across the night sky to the west. Wingate Foster, through the powers of Dr. Acula, will again be permitted to walk. When watching this scene, the summoning of spirits causes instruments to float and bob in the air, sounded by invisible forces. It's pretty silly, and it's clear director Ed Wood was parodying the increasing number of hoaxes that so-called mediums were perpetrating. Despite such frauds and the eye-rolling of science, Seances, psychics, and the like have continued to captivate the popular imagination. The Ouija board began being sold in 1890, capitalizing on the spiritualist zeitgeist of America. True or false, the illusion of truth has real influence. And from the beginning, America 
has been obsessed with ghosts. In the same year that the Fox sisters first demonstrated the wrappings of Mr. Splitfoot, a fascinating figure was born, someone who throughout the late 19th century would become internationally renowned as a psychic pianist and the strangest man in the world. Francis Grierson was born Jesse Shepherd in Birkenhead, England on September 18th, 1849. We'll get into the name change later, but I'll call him Grierson throughout. He moved to America with his family shortly after he was born, settling in the wild prairies of Illinois. Grierson's life there was rich with experience. Though UK born, Grierson literally lived American history during a significant cultural period. When Grierson was a child, fugitive slaves stayed at his family's log cabin, which served as an underground railway post. He was in attendance at the Lincoln-Douglas debates in Alton and viewed Abraham Lincoln as a prophetic hero for the remainder of his life, even writing a book about it. He witnessed firsthand the American Civil War and its aftermath, as well as the emergence of industrialism. Meanwhile, the Methodist culture he grew up in celebrated visionary experiences and spontaneous ecstatic expression. One historian described their preaching style as more psychopathic than the witchcraft mania. Grierson described the life of the times in his still highly regarded memoir, The Valley of the Shadows. In the late 1850s, the people of Illinois were being prepared for the new era by a series of scenes and incidents which nothing but the term mystical will fittingly describe. Things came about not so much by a preconceived method as by an impelling impulse. The appearance of Uncle Tom's cabin was not a reason, but an illumination. The founding of the Republican Party was not an act of political wire pulling, but an inspiration. The great religious revivals and the appearance of two comets were not regarded as coincidences, but accepted as signs of divine preparation and warning. Never trained in music nor familiar with an instrument, a young Grierson had a profound experience the first time he played the piano. It was during a visit to Niagara Falls with his family that a 16-year-old Grierson came upon a piano and played the instrument for the first time. As he recounted, in fooling over the keys I happened to strike a full chord, and I at once realized the influence and direction of something independent of my intellect and will. Little did I dream when I awoke to a realization of my hidden faculty on that Sunday at Niagara Falls, of the ordeals attendant on a wandering life which was to endure as a sort of apprenticeship for more than 40 years. A few years later, he wandered past a lecture hall on 35th and Broadway in New York. He saw a piano nearby, approached it, and began playing. Grierson described the experience as follows. There was not time for a prelude. With an allegro accompaniment and chords that produced the effect of a piano duet, I attacked a high C and held it long enough for the people in the street to stop and listen. In less than two minutes, people began to rush back into the hall and continued coming until my audience must have been nearly as large as the audience that had left. From there, Grierson traveled and performed across the Western Hemisphere, first to Paris and then all over Europe. His mysterious talents and unique style wowed his audiences, not to mention his strange appearance. He rouged his cheeks, waxed or dyed orange his mustache. He wore wigs and a ruby ring surrounded by diamonds, not to mention a fur coat made of 3,000 squirrel skins. He was praised in newspapers as the greatest living musician, the strangest man in the world, and the amazing psychic pianist. He performed for kings and queens across Europe, earning lavish gifts of clothing and jewelry. No audio recordings exist of Grierson's medial music. So our best window into what a concert or seance was actually like is through the reviews of the people who were there. In the 1880s, after his extensive tour of Europe, Grierson gave a series of musical seances at the parlor of Miss H. H. Crocker in Chicago. An attendant of the seances reported that Grierson demanded that no more than 12 or at most 14 persons be admitted with each being charged two dollars. Grierson covered the windows and locked the doors to perform his seance in complete darkness and privacy. Once seated, Grierson had all attendants hold each other's hands. 
And in this particular instance, once all attention was given to him, he announced that he was being controlled by a band of Egyptian spirits, the leader of whom had lived on earth when the pyramids were young. Then Grierson gave what was then and has constantly been his leading performance. After this, he sang in two voices, a feat which has astonished so many listeners. Santag, some familiar spirit, singing in one voice, and the Egyptian in the other. Another spirit accompanied on harp. Between the musical pieces, Grierson, under the influence, gave tests and described spirit friends. Through his renown, Grierson managed to convince two architects, the High Brothers, to custom design a Victorian mansion to his specifications. Built in 1887, the Villa Montezuma, named after the ship that brought Grierson's family to America, featured ornate woodwork, Persian rugs, and stained glass windows, one featuring Grierson as a saint. Numerous seances were held at the villa, where guests reported hearing drums, tambourines, trumpets, and a choir of voices sounding all over the room. But unique to the villa, one author writes, hidden chambers and crawl spaces behind the wall and fireplace may have helped Grierson produce the mysterious voices often heard during his concerts. It was around the time that Grierson began focusing on writing that he felt compelled to change his name. That was in 1889, with the publication of his first English language book called Modern Mysticism. That's when Jesse Shepard became Francis Grierson. Over the next two decades, Grierson was fiercely prolific with publications, both with books and periodicals. His writings were praised by some of the greatest artists and intellectuals of the time, including William James and Maurice Miterlink. Grierson's style of writing was truly original, often ornately poetic, as when he describes a theater as a cauldron of emotional witch broth or a hotbed of paradox. However, his books often fuse travel writing, esoteric philosophy, biographical reflection, as well as politics and art criticism. To this day, Grierson's 19th century memoir, The Valley of the Shadows, is regarded as one of the most detailed first-hand accounts of the period. Painting a portrait of America before the Civil War, Grierson's testament has been praised as a classic of American memoir. Not long after living in the Villa Montezuma, Grierson fell behind in payments, and in 1896 he moved to London with his lifelong partner and assistant, Lawrence Waldemar Tonner. The two men would return to the U.S. in 1913, and ultimately settle in Los Angeles by 1920. In 1921, at the age of 73, Grierson published his last book called Psychophone Messages, a collection of spirit communications with historical and political figures that Grierson had personally compiled. Spirits contacted included Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and many others. Grierson also championed the development of a spiritual telephone technology. Interestingly, Thomas Edison was considering something similar at the time. Edison claimed that it is possible to construct an apparatus which will be so delicate that if there are personalities in another existence who wish to get in touch with us in this existence, this apparatus will at least give them a better opportunity to express themselves. While Grierson received little money for his later efforts, he was nurtured by his partner Tonner, who worked as a breadwinner at various jobs supporting the two. Nevertheless, with increasing poverty, Grierson had to sell off all the royal gifts which kings and queens had bestowed on him in his younger years. Malnourished and poor, he nevertheless continued performing. In fact, he died as his hands played the final chord of his last performance. This is how his lifelong partner, Lawrence Waldemar Tonner, recounted Grierson's swan song. It was Sunday evening, May 29th, 1927. We had a number of people invited for a musical recital at our home, about 30. A collection was to be taken up. Mr. Grierson had played a number of his marvelous instantaneous compositions on the piano and had given the company a talk on his experiences and impressions of France and Italy. He turned to the instrument and announced that the next and last piece of the evening would be an oriental improvisation, Egyptian in character. The piece was long, and when it seemed to be finished, he sat perfectly still as if resting after the ordeal of this tremendous composition. He often did that, but it lasted too long and I went up to him. He was gone. 
His head was only slightly bent forward, as usual in playing, while his hands rested on the keys of the last chord he had touched. There had not been the slightest warning. He had seemed in usual health. He always had some indigestion. He had eaten well to gain strength for the evening, and he had been smiling and laughing with the company even a few moments before he passed away. Unfortunately, what Grierson actually sounded like in performance is left to the reviewer commentary and your imagination. However, decades later, another British medial pianist, Rosemary Brown, claimed to be communicating with the spirits of deceased composers like Chopin, Schubert, Beethoven, and Liszt. They even dictated new compositions to her, she claimed. The composition that's playing right now was sent to her by Chopin. In the following interview, she talks a little bit about her interactions with Chopin. It's quite wonderful to get to know these composers as people, and it is, of course, a great privilege. Chopin is not at all like I might have thought he would be. He's not melancholy at all. He's quite light-hearted. His conversation is bantering, and he often teases and makes little jokes. Um, he's a very quick worker. He, he works far more quickly than any of the other composers. And I've also found that he's very considerate. If he's been working with me and we've got, say, two pages of music written out, and then he finds my concentration is waning because I'm getting tired, he winds the piece of music off quickly so it, is, it isn't left incomplete. But then sometime later, this can be weeks or months later, he'll come along and say, well, now I'll give you the rest of such and such a piece of music. And he'll give me quite an, a number of bars, perhaps two or three dozen bars, but instead of this being added to the end of the music, he tells me exactly where it has to be inserted in the music. For those who want to know a little more about Francis Grierson, most of his publications are available for free online. And feel free to check out my exhaustive essay, The Illusioned Ear, published online at earwaveevent.org. Or take a trip to San Diego and visit the Villa Montezuma. It's still there and is now a community space, an architectural landmark, and an archive and memorial to Grierson's life there. Let me just leave you with Grierson's words, a quote in particular that carries some added weight in our increasingly simulated reality today. All is mystery. Whatever we do, we cannot escape that fact. This is the fundamental law which causes the illusion of progress and a constant desire to acquire more knowledge, to seek the unseen, the unheard, the unknown. Mystery engenders illusion, the most wonderful and subtle of all the primordial elements. Everything revolves or reposes on illusion it is the action exercised on the mind by some person or something, and we are always under its influence, whether it be good or bad or indifferent. Indefinable though they be, illusions are nevertheless realities. I'm Matt Marble, and you've been listening to Secret Sound. <laughs>